My name is Christy Wolf. I am Vice President for Policy and Planning at the National Alliance. And we're really glad to have you here online with us today to talk about the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, it was signed into a law last week and it's $1.9 trillion um, of aid for our country and an historic investment in education. Um, all this money is coming to you soon and with a deadline for spending it. So we wanted to get you the details about um, funds for education in schools and this bill as quickly as possible um, and answer your questions today. So I'm really thrilled to be here with our team at the Penn Hill Group um, to uh, walk through the legislation and education provisions and then answer your questions. Um, as we go through the presentation, um, as you're surely used to now with um, webinars these days, you can put your questions in the Q&A um, section of the chat and uh, you may get an answer in real time or we will um, address them live at the end of the presentation. So um, Penn Hill Group has been a partner of ours for a long time and um, have a deep and extensive knowledge and um, experience on the congressional and executive branches. With us today we have Vic Klatt and he's a principal at the Penn Hill Group um, and he's been involved in federal education for a long time, a uh, long time enough to have been my boss at one point, we won't say how long ago that was, um, as well as top education official for the House Education and Workforce Committee. Um, also, we have Lindsay Fryer, who's a senior vice president at the Penn Hill Group um, with extensive experience on Capitol Hill, working for Chairman um, Alexander and the Senate Health Committee and on the Education and Workforce Committee. Uh, Tom Corwin is a senior advisor at the Penn Hill Group um, with many years of experience in education policy and decades at the US Department of Education Budget Office. Um, and he is um, a critical resource that we have to um, help us think creatively and legally when it comes to spending federal education dollars. Um, and our webinars are always available afterwards as a recording on our website um, and that um, link was playing ahead of time and will be at the end. So um, you, these resources will be available to you um, afterwards or if you can't stay the whole time. So with that, we have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay, thanks. Thanks, Christy, I'm gonna share my screen and then Tom is going to begin the first part of our presentation. Just trying to find this, oh, here it is. One second, there we go. Hmm. Here it is, sorry about that. Ready to go? One second, I just wanna start it from the beginning. All right. There we go. Okay. Here we go, Tom. Okay. Um, thank you, Lindsay. And thank you to Christy and the Alliance for inviting us today. Um, we're going to walk through, for the most part, the new funding that the uh, Congress has just passed and President Biden has just signed for the Recovery Act. But let's start out first by putting it in context. The Congress actually passed three pieces of, as you probably know, three pieces of COVID relief legislation in the last year, providing an unprecedented amount of resources to schools and other entities for dealing with the pandemic and its implications. If you look at together what the Department of Education received from the three from CARES, the CRRSA, and now the Recovery Act, ARPA, total of 277.7 billion, quite a lot of money. By comparison, the regular fiscal year 2021 regular appropriation for discretionary programs in the department. Everything in K-12, higher ed, most of, some of the student aid dollars, research and statistics and everything else they get was about 73 billion. So you're talking three and a half, almost four times as much money in this one year for this extraordinary emergency. Going to the next slide, 
let's just look at the ESSER money, um, which is the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, which I'm think sure you're somewhat aware of. You put the three together, 189 billion. That's more than about four and a half times as much as the regular K appropriation for K-12 programs in the department for this year, including everything in Title I, IDEA, CTE, Adult Ed, the various title programs and so forth. So you're looking at a lot of money. It's unprecedented. Um, some people compare it to what happened uh, a decade and a half ago with the Recovery Act in 2009. It's much larger than that. It's much larger than anything I can think of. So sort of one of the basic messages is think big, think bigger than you have in the past. Still, still think smart. You don't want to spend the money on things that you don't want to see written about in the newspaper or on web or TV or whatever. Um, but you're going to want to probably think differently because it's just that much money. You do have a while to spend it, um, but it's again, more than you're used to dealing with. Can Continuing, these are the different funding pots that the new legislation provides for K-12 programs. As I showed earlier, there's ESSER, which is almost 122 billion, billion. There's another 800 million there for identifying and serving homeless students. Um, this doesn't go specifically into the McKinney-Vento program, um, but it, I think it'll be allocated uh, by formula to states for doing McKinney-Vento kind of things having to do with serving those students in this particular circumstance. The Congress put about a th another 3 billion into IDEA with 2.6 of it into Part B. So there's a bump up for, uh, for your special education programs. And for the second time in, in the CRRSA, this program started, now it got another dollop of money, the emergency assistance to non-public schools at 2.75 billion, which people are calling EANS, probably not a great uh, area of interest to this particular audience, but another thing that the states and the Department of Education are gonna be administering in the next year or so. Um, continuing, how did the ESSER funds get allocated? Um, this time around, there's no secretary's discretionary pot, 100% goes down to the states based on their most recent Title I shares, which will be the fiscal year 2020 shares. At the state level, 10% can be reserved by the state departments of education. Not, at least 90% has to go to the school districts. Um, the, the SEA money gets carved up more than we've seen in the, in the past packages. Um, at least 5% must be used for activities to address learning loss through evidence-based interventions. At least 1% must be used for evidence-based summer enrichment programs. 1% must be used for evidence-based comprehensive after-school programs. There's some lack of clarity, I think, in the bill about whether those 1% and 1% have to be in addition to the 5%. I think it depends who you talk to. We haven't yet heard from U.S. Department of Education about how that's going to work out yet. Um, but in addition to that, states may use at least, uh, up to half a percent for a state admin. Um, so they've got 3% or maybe it's 5% for other things that the states may want to do. Um, in addition to these other things, they may want to, for instance, make grants to the school districts, including charter districts that aren't, aren't Title I recipients and therefore won't receive the uh, formula money, which is the subject of the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the states have to allocate at least 90% to the school districts. That goes out by formula. Um, as I'll discuss in a little while, there's a broad range of activities that the LEAs can use the money for, but they have to use at least 20% for activities to address learning loss through evidence-based interventions. This is kind of the new theme of this third round of the legislation, a major focus on re uh, remediating learning loss that so many of the students have experienced during the shutdown period. I know on dealing with both the SEA and S LEA learning loss money, they must so, those activities must also address, address students' social emotional needs and address the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on subgroups of students. What are the allowable uses of funds? This is pretty similar to what you saw under CARES and CRRSA. Almost anything so long as it's related to 
to preventing, preparing for, and responding to COVID. That includes anything authorized under ESEA, IDEA, the Adult Ed Act, and the Perkins CTA Act, CTE Act, which basically covers almost anything legitimate that you'd want to do. Um, then the statute lists a number of other things. Um, even though, as I said, it basically already said you can kind of do anything, but it, it, activities to address the unique learning loss of different subgroups of students, technology purchases, sanitation and cleaning supplies, mental health services and supports, facilities repairs and improvements related to reopening schools, COVID testing, again, learning loss activities, and we put et cetera down there because it lists some additional ones as well. But as I said, you can already do kind of anything. A new element this time is that in order to receive the funds, each school district must develop and make publicly available on its website and not less than 30 days after rec of receiving its allocation, a plan for the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services. So Congress, I think through this, evinced a, an intent that the money really be used to reopen schools make sure things continue to the extent possible. Before making the plan available, the district must seek public comment on it and then must take any comments in, into consideration in putting together its final plan. But if they already have a plan that meets these requirements, they don't have to do a new one. Briefly, there are maintenance of effort and then a new thing we're calling maintenance of equity requirements on, on this new funding. Um, a state must provide support for K-12 and for higher ed in each of fiscal years 22 and 23, at least in the same proportion of overall state funding as it provided on average in fiscal years 27 through 20, uh, 2017 through 2019. In other words, if on average it was using 20% of its overall state budget for, well, say 30% for K-12, 20% for higher ed, it would have to provide at least that pro proportion in 22 and 23. This is the same as we had under the last bill, it's just extended out one more year. As under the earlier laws, the state may go to the US Department of Education for a waiver of MOE. I don't think we've seen that happen yet. I don't know how the department is gonna treat the waiver request, what kind of standards it's gonna apply, but we will see. And then this new maintenance of equity thing. Um, Briefly, a state may not for the two, year, two fiscal years, 22 and 23, reduce per pupil funding for its high need LEAs by an amount that exceeds overall per pupil, per pupil reduction to all LEAs in the state. What's a high need LEA? Basically, if you rank all your school districts in order based on their percentage of educationally disadvantaged kids, meaning the, the highest poverty district first and the lowest poverty last, and you count down them, until you get to the district that serves, until you get to serving 50% of the kids in the state, those districts cannot receive a disproportionate reduction per pupil in their state fund. In addition, there's a, a requirement re regarding the highest poverty districts in the state, which are the districts, the highest poverty districts serving at least 20% of the state's students. They can't receive any reduction at all in 22 or 23, below the 2019 level. In addition, there's an LEA maintenance of equity requirement, which is that the district may not reduce per pupil funding, combined state and local, to any of its high poverty health schools. These are the schools in the highest quartile and percentage of students who are economically disadvantaged using a criterion, a criterion determined by the state, they cannot reduce their funding by more than the average per pupil reduction for all schools. In addition, there's a maintenance of equity requirement regarding staffing. The district may not reduce per pupil full-time equivalent staffing to any of the high poverty LEAs by more than the district average. There, is a, there are exceptions to these ma this LEA maintenance of equity requirement doesn't apply to the smallest districts, those with less than a thousand students, those that have only one school per grade span or one school total, or any that can demonstrate exceptional or uncontrollable circumstances to the US department. 
we'll see how that goes in terms of waivers. My final thing I'll talk about a little bit is the timeline for allocating and obligating the, these new funds. The US department must obligate all the funds by September 23. They'll do that. They'll probably obligate the money very shortly. School, the state education agencies must award all ESSER funds within one year of receipt. Any remaining funds must be returned to the department for allocation to other states. By award, they mean um, make the allocations to LEAs, make allocations or grants through the SEA set aside, basically um, obligate the money at the state level. At the school district level, they have until September 2023 to, to obligate the money, except that the tidings amendment, which applies annually to the US Department of Education formula grants gives them actually till 2024. What you've seen under the three pieces of legislation we received, the first one gave until September 22, CRSA gave it till September 23, and this one one more year. What, what period of time can you spend the money for? Well, actually it allows you to fund pre-award costs incurred beginning on the date that the US government declared an emergency for COVID. In other words, back to March 13th of 2020, the date of the, the, that declaration. I will now turn it over to Lindsay. Thanks, Tom. Um, in terms of other things that we're going to talk about. Um, just to that point, actually, we just saw Secretary Cardona a little bit ago say that the ESSER money to states would be out um, this month. So they're moving pretty quickly to get this money out the door. I just wanted to add on to that since that was, we just heard that. There's also additional money for things that I know are very important to school districts like emergency connectivity and broadband. Uh, the legislation provides 7.2 billion to support schools and libraries within the same eligibility as the E-rate program to be able to purchase connected devices such as laptops or tablets or Wi-Fi hotspots or connected devices um, to provide directly to families for use to, to get online um, during this emergency. The way that the program will work, the department's gonna, the, the FCC, excuse me, is going to put out regulations within 60 days to figure out specifically how this would work, but it's supposed to be a reimbursement program that, that districts, schools, and libraries will be reimbursed for the funds that they, that they upfront to, to buy these devices um, up to 100% subject to a cap that the FCC could determine as reasonable. In addition to this, there's also 10 billion provided to states through the uh, to state governors through the uh, state and local relief fund that could be for capital projects such as broadband to deal with education, healthcare, and workplace issues. Um, so there's another opportunity if the state so decides to pursue additional broadband access for schools. We wanted to talk a little bit also about the common uses of funds um, that we that some people have been asking about. Um, one that we get all the time is can COVID funds be used for additional staff pay and compensation? Tom touched broadly on that, you know, almost anything is really allowed under this legislation. We'll talk a little bit about strategy and determining how to use your funds. But for this, um, we just wanted to note that the original guidance for ESSER 1 and 2 noted that generally funds should not be used for bonuses, merit pay, or similar expenditures unless directly related to COVID. So you can see here on the slide that there are specific things that an LEA could do to, to, to use money for bonuses and compensation, such as uh, addressing recruitment or retention challenges in light of COVID-19 providing um, additional compensation for staff that have taken on new responsibilities during the emergency, or incentivizing teachers to go teach in other schools that might have particularly disadvantaged populations of students that have been impacted by the pandemic. Transportation is another big area that we often get asked about. Um, certainly if uh, a school district decided to expand additional bus routes due to, to accommodate for more social distancing within the given buses that they have, that would be allowed. Purchasing additional buses would also be allowed, but we just wanted to make sure that there are specific federal guidelines and regulations that govern some of these capital project purchases. Um, and in particular, these purchases would need to, the, the LAs would need to receive approval from the state, and then the state would have to receive approval from the department for this purchase to occur uh, following uh, federal equipment management rules, but it certainly would be allowed, just there'd be another layer of approval needed. High quality instructional materials um, certainly can be allowed as well in terms of a purchase. 
um, with no federal guard, uh, guidelines as to in terms of who needs to be served. So a district or school could purchase materials for a subset of students, for all of their students, or in combination of both uh, following federal procurement guidelines. We just wanted to make sure that was clear. Real property or modular classrooms, um, as long as it relates to COVID-19, um, if you wanted to build out a classroom to accommodate for social distancing, uh, would absolutely be allowed, but again, subject to an additional approval by the state and uh, the federal government, the Department of Education. The same goes for renovation or construction. Um, if you wanted to upgrade your buildings, replacing tile, replacing an HVAC system, um, upgrading paints on the walls, um, you know, these things to, to come in with fire safety codes um, related to COVID-19, these would all be allowed, but there would, there are federal specific regulations that would have to be followed as well as David Bacon pre prevailing wage rules. We're not going to get into those specifically, but the point here is these things are allowed, but there are other federal considerations that you need to take into, into account. And then lastly, another common use of funds we hear about is whether or not these funds can address budgetary shortfalls that states or districts may be experiencing um, due to the COVID-19 pan pandemic. And certainly um, these funds are absolutely allowed to do that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that was that you were aware of that. So in terms of how to spend these funds, you know, as Tom mentioned, this is a ton of money. It's more than education has ever seen in terms of federal dollars. So there should be some guiding questions to think about when you're planning for how to use this money. Um, and here's, here's five key examples. First and foremost, all the money per the statute has to be used to prepare, prevent for, and respond to COVID-19. So when you're thinking about the framing here, can there be a justification for the use you're choosing that relates to the pandemic? The second is, you might wanna consider is, does this directly support parent, teacher, or student needs? You know, this money is meant to help schools reopen ultimately to get kids back on track for learning. So we wanna make sure that any expenses that you're thinking about using the money for directly re relate to the needs of the constituents, if you will, of your, of your schools. Is there data to support effectiveness of these use of funds? You know, Some of the programs in particular that Tom talked about, the after-school set aside, the summer enrichment set aside, the learning loss set aside, do call for an evidence base behind them. Not all of the uses of funds have to have an evidence base. But if we want to show impact of these dollars down the road, it might be a good consideration to say, is the thing that I'm looking to support with these dollars have an evidence base behind it or something that we think could justify an impact in the future? Are there additional approvals needed to do this activity and is it allowed? You know, as we mentioned, almost anything is allowed. But if you saw in the previous slides, if you want to do things like transport buy a bus for transportation or, you know, could do construction or renovation projects. There is an additional level of approval needed to do that. It's not that that can't be done, but just think about in terms of spend down timeline when you might want to start these projects to make sure that you're meeting timelines. And then another really important thing, particularly for charter schools, which is Vic will touch on later, is what would the headline be if, if it got out what, you're, what you were gonna use your funds for? You know, these funds will need to be tracked. Um, the department's gonna put out additional guidance about how to track expenditures. And as those things become public, is your, is your storyline, is, is your school leader comfortable with what your critics and supporters might say about how you're spending the money um, as there's additional oversight down the road that might come with these dollars? Other things to consider, make sure there's no conflicts of interest in the contracts that and the providers that you're picking. Um, you know, that, that's something that will probably be under scrutiny. How, lack of transparency, how easy would it be to track these dollars when you have to report them and justify the use? Additional layer of support we talked about. And, you know, again, charters may be under some scrutiny um, as we go and do some oversight, some of these dollars. So make sure that you can justify the use of your funds as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, and then just a couple of additional thoughts about planning. So a good strategy to think about in terms of showing impact is it's probably good to get some money out the door initially to show that these funds were needed and justify that, you know, the, the large amount of dollars that Congress has provided. So urgent immediately urgent immediate uses such as safety upgrades to your school or PPP or retaining staff to make sure that kids can come back in person, immediate triage for learning loss, those are all things that immediately you can spend down while still thinking about comprehensive planning for the future. Um, and then also, I think your school, once the Department of Ed guidance comes out, is going to think about how you track how you're using this money and measure broader impact overall, because it will, it will be important to show this down the road. 
But specifically, you know, you can use this money to like as things change over time and you want to change the direction of your money by collecting data and having a system for measuring impact, you'll know, um, you know, where changes need to be made. Then the last point here is, you know, as Tom mentioned, there's, you know, you have a while to spend down this money. Um, it's probably a good good idea to take some time to say what's our comprehensive plan moving forward and not just spend on one-off things that you think might you know fix the problem of the day but think very strategically about comprehensively how do we want to improve our school system over overall for an extended period of time um, some things like you know we know that learning loss and social emotional needs of kids are going to take some time so those should probably be in that planning but specifically keeping in mind that you know, at some point, this federal money is going to stop flowing. There, there will be a federal funding cliff. So making sure that the activities that you're choosing have some type of long-term long -term sustainability and they can be maintained when the federal funding is gone. And then I'm going to turn it over to Vic to talk about what's coming next um, in terms of additional packages. So, so just a couple quick things to add. One is a um, little bit of late breaking news. We also have just learned there's going to be another $10 billion program that's going to go to schools uh, for COVID testing. Um, we're still not sure about the details. Lindsay and I were just uh, emailing a little bit back and forth on this. Looks like it'll have something to do with the CDC and, uh, and uh, some of the guidelines they're suggesting too, but stay tuned for that and there'll be more information there. And, and one other thing too, before getting to this slide, uh, Lindsay and Tom did a great job of outlining all the different ways that you can spend the money and all the money that's coming. But I, I, I just cannot emphasize enough to uh, re remember, um, just because you can spend money on some things, that doesn't always mean you should. Uh, charter schools are always under extra scru scrutiny, as you guys know even better than us. Uh, and just you know, be very careful. It doesn't mean you shouldn't push the envelope and shouldn't do things that uh, uh, that uh, you've been planning to do, uh, uh, but just be very careful and remember about the extra scrutiny that uh, that uh, charters will be under as you go forward and and uh, deal with all this incoming money. So we've outlined all the different things that are uh, uh, all the different uh, programs and uh, funding sources that are on the way. And just so you know, there could be more. And that's what this slide is all about. It's quite possible that later on in the year, potentially beginning uh, in a couple months and probably taking into the fall, uh, the legislative process will probably go into the fall. There could be another reconciliation bill. Uh, and some of the figures they're talking about right now could be even higher than this last reconciliation bill, as much as maybe three or four trillion dollars could be in this next package. And some of the possible uh, uh, funding uh, uh, uses of funds uh, under this next reconciliation bill include the, uh, some of the items on the list that you see before you. Infrastructure, including potential, potentially school construction funds, which would, uh, we're, we're very uh, hopeful, will include possibly charter school uh, um, construction funds. Issues like climate change, immigration, there could be more broadband money in there. Uh, there could be another job training program could find its way into this reconciliation bill. There's even uh, some discussion about pre-K education and, and uh, some, some additional focus on that. So um, be on the lookout for what could be coming down the pike a little bit later on. And Christy, I think we're gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm going to just talk a little bit um, about some additional considerations for charter schools and accessing funds um, and how charter schools should benefit based on um, the enrollment share of students that we educate across public schools nationwide. So just looking at the proportion of students um, and students in poverty, we estimate that um, if charters were to get their equitable share, regardless of their LEA status, 7 billion of these ESSER funds should be going to charter school students. Um, we've heard, um, we've got mixed information um, from the last two tranches of funding other under ESSER. Um, it's, it certainly seems to be working better if you're your own charter LEA um, in terms of the transparent process and the money that you're getting. Um, 
it also seems to be um, less than transparent if you're a district authorized charter and the funds that you're getting and whether or not um, they're being shared equitably. Um, so uh, what we are encouraging you all to consider, especially if you're not an LEA charter, um, and given the um, magnitude of funding that's coming down to districts, um, is to, to leverage some of the, the newer reporting requirements on ESSER to push districts to uh, be as transparent as possible, to um, get as much input as possible from its partners and how they're going to use their funds. Um, and in particular, in the area of the 20% the requirement for districts to set aside or to direct funds for learning loss activities. Um, if you're a district authorized charter, the, you may not want to participate in those district-wide activities or in the same way as what the district is thinking of. Um, that seems like a particular um, portion of the funding that um, depending on your district situation, you may want to um, lobby for control over that funding as well, as opposed to getting the services or <clears throat> um, however they else they choose to use the funding. Um, there is a significant amount of money at the state level, the 10% um, reservation that is designated for different purposes. Um, so that could create opportunities for partnerships um, with other nonprofit organizations to apply for those fundings, to, to lobby up front for um, where those funds should be directed. Um, there you could have a program already, um, say for supporting um, your high school students um, applying and getting into college. Um, maybe that's a model that your district may have already been interested in. Um, may, so maybe there's a partnership opportunity there. Um, so I think there's, given the, the lack of scarcity of funds right now, maybe it will warm up relationships um, and opportunities that may other not, otherwise not have been there. <clears throat> it's also important for you to know whether you're um, if you're a, a charter school within a district or a charter LEA, if you're in the top um, uh, quintile of poverty in the state or district, so that you know whether this maintenance of equity provision applies to you and prevents disproportionate funding cuts or in a district FTE cuts. <clears throat> There's never been a provision like this. I shouldn't say never, but um, this is a, a very unique type of equity um, protection. Um, because it impacts state and local funding and is not um, federal funding. Um, so I think we're going to be interested in how the department implements this and enforces it. Uh, but there are a fair number of charter LEAs in a state in some of the states we started looking at that would qualify that would fall into this high poverty designation because of their single school LEA status and then um, in high urban areas, high poverty amounts. And we've looked at one state where 80% of the charter LEAs based on our data um, are in the top 20% of poverty in a state. So this could have um, significant implications for charters and we're just beginning to, to get our um, handle on the data and what that means and how the provision will work. Um, it's also important to note that you know, the Title I formula has its um, benefits for allocating these funds, but there are um, some uh, components of it that will be magnified because of the massive amount of funds that's gonna be flowing through it. And especially if you're a charter LEA that for whatever reason you've chosen not to participate in Title I or you're not qualifying for funds, you know, you're going to see a lot of money go past you, um, there will be a significant amount of money at the state level. And um, these are funds that a state could use to um, allocate to um, charter, charters and charters LEA, charter LEAs that aren't being well served by the Title I formula within the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's just an important thing to note, um, given um, I think a number of charters that are um, in that situation. Um, so happy to answer more questions on this, but those are just some of the um, unique charter issues that I wanted to flag. So we've got a number of questions. Um, and I think we're gonna start with questions related to school construction, because I saw that as a pattern. So um, let's see, there was a question about 
Um, to what extent is school construction allowable? Can you buy a new building? Um, if it's justified. And then another question about COVID related construction and that um, they, they're concerned about the additional approval that um, Lindsay, I think you flagged or Tom, I forget. Um, and what, what does that mean to get state approval? And, and did, does the state really have to go to the Department of Ed to get approval for an individual charter request for school construction? Okay, um, there are two places in the ESSER authorization that specifically mentioned facilities. And then there's the broad authorization to do anything that's allowed under ESEA. The two specific mentions are school facility repairs and improvements to enable operation of schools to reduce the risk of virus transmission and exposure to environmental health hazards and inspection, testing, maintenance, repair, replacement and upgrade projects to improve air, indoor air quality. Um, those two things are clearly authorized because it says so. Um, the authorization to do anything that's in ESEA includes impact aid, which for those who are familiar with it, basically provides general assistance to districts to do anything needed to continue the operation of the district, including school construction. The department, US department has clarified that put all that together and yes, construction is allowable. I would uh, hesitate a little bit to say absolutely for everything though, because there is this general requirement, which the department has focused on a bit, that anything you do must be for responding to, preparing for preventing and responding to COVID. Um, so if you can justify it on that grounds, I think you can do it. Clearly anything with indoor air quality um, and ventilation. Um, I would say things that if you need for more social distancing, which I suppose could be building another building if you need for social distancing. Uh, clearly renting a modular one though, and, and that's been discussed in different places. Um, so I think if you can make the case that it is needed to respond to COVID, it's not just something you were gonna do and it has nothing you can't justify it on that basis. You should be okay. Um, in the general federal regulations for grants, there is language on construction. Um, this is in 2 CFR 200.439, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It says capital expenditures for general purpose equipment, buildings and land are unallowable as direct charges, except with the prior written approval of the federal awarding agency or pass-through entity. I think in this case, the SEA is the pass-through entity. Um, the person who put that in the chat box said they did include it in their application um, and it was approved. Did they need special approval? I think if you put it in your application and it was approved, you have approval. You don't need an additional approval beyond that. You might check with your SEA, but it sounds like you're good to go. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we have another kind of specific use of funds question. So while we're on that um, question is, can we claim existing employees such as directors and executives that spent time last year in planning and executing shutdown, distance learning, meal services, oh, this is everything, meal services and tech impl implementation and other operational and educational execution. So I think the question is, um, if you've already spent the money last year, um, or it may be, Christy, is it okay to fund existing employees? I think the answer is there is there's no supplement, not supplant. So you can fund activities, again, something related to dealing with the virus, which it sounds like they're doing. Um, going back to March 13th of last year, when the emergency was declared, I'll leave it open to others to want to comment on that, but I think that's the best reading. I agree. Um, one, um, let's see. We have a couple questions on timeline as well. I know we talked about the availability of the funds and the different allocations under ESSER. And it sounds like funds under, under ESSER 3 will start flowing, you said next month, right? Um, but they said even that, as early as in the next month, in so the next within month. a month. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and it sounds like a lot of states are just getting SR2 funds out the door. So should, it, it seems, at least it seems to me thus far um, that this is really a planning exercise for the summer or school year following. Do you all have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think we've, you know, that certainly could be the case for some areas. I think it's very contingent upon your local context. Like if some schools are open now and you have immediate needs, like they might start spending some of these funds, even ESSER one or two or even three now. Um, there could be summer activities though that, you know, warrant some use of these funds as well if, if you know, you wanna start addressing learning loss then. So um, I think the strategy depends on what you guys think your needs are. And like, you know, I think what we are trying to stress is, a comprehensive plan is best rather than like one off here, one off there, because then, you know, when you hit a fiscal cliff in a couple of years and you won't have more money, you want to make sure that what you've chosen to do is, is sustainable. But certainly it could be that you don't use any of the funds this year and, and completely leave them for next year. That's definitely a possibility. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have an IDEA related question on, um, I guess the, with additional funding, how the what what the impact will be for MOE at the local level? Hmm. hmm I'm not sure. I don't. Local MOE. Usually, a state requirement. Yeah. Um, well, the interesting thing about the IDEA money, though, just to underscore that, like, since that flows through IDEA, the federal requirements related to IDEA will apply to those $3 billion. You know, the ESSER money that's outside, that, that's outside and above and beyond the $3 billion that we mentioned for IDEA, different federal rules apply. It's not ESEA Title I, it's not, you know, Supplement Not Supplant, it has their own rules, but the money that goes through IDEA has to follow I, all IDEA rules. Right. Right. So I don't think we have any specific information about uh, impacts on local funding or if there are any. Um, one thing we didn't really touch on was um, school meals. Um, and there, there were um, provisions related to um, meals and uh, pandemic MBT in this, but um, Lindsay or Tom, can you speak to any anything to highlight here on school meals? I'm sorry. Well, there was, oh, go ahead, Lindsay. Well, there was an additional, there was not additional money for specific money for school meals in this bill. However, one of the allowable uses of ESSER specifically relates to the provision of school meals for students. So it's absolutely allowed. The other thing that's happening simultaneous though is the Department of Agriculture, I think recently as of last week did provide like an addition, additional flexibility waivers for some school, uh, I think it's for the school lunch program to continue what's been going on. Um, so that's the latest that we have on that information, not specific dedicated money in this bill, but um, all of these funds could be used for school meals if that's what a, a district or, or wanted to use them for. It's an explicit allowable use. Did you have anything else, Tom? Nope. Oh, thank you. All right, we have another question. Are there any prohibitions to an SEA allocating ESSER funds to a new charter school that does not yet have its Title I students identified? This question includes both a 90% portion going to LEAs and 10% set asides. So um, there's two components to that. Um, there's very specific guidance um, related to the allocation of the local ESSER funds to charter schools that are new or expanding. So they don't have prior year Title I counts on which to base the allocations. And there's guidance on how to, to come up with that. It's, it's the same method that is used to come up with a Title I allocation. Now, in terms of the state and when the state sets its deadlines and guidelines for when a charter school that is opening needs to get its data to the state to get that money. Um, I think states have very different practices for that, but there's no prohibition in the statute for 
awarding if your if your school is going to be a title one school and it's, and it's it's because you're new and the data um cycle is not um taken place yet with the department it that is not a prohibition at all that's not an impediment in fact in fact there's positive guidance on how to make sure you get those funds and there's not any title one eligibility requirement for um the funds that are allocated by the state um, except for the homeless reservation um, which I think there will probably be additional guidance, but I think based on Tom's read, it's a Title I allocation process. But the other programs may can be competitive. Um, there's there's a fair amount of flexibility in, in how those funds could be used. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if um, any of the flexibility we've seen in the use of the governor's funds, the gear funds that were in SO, um, the first two COVID bills, um, you know, Tennessee awarded grants directly to charter schools for replication and expansion to expand their capacity. Um, you know, some of that could be done um, for different purposes for summer enrichment or learning loss. I, um, it'd be interesting to see how creative states are for that. Um, hopefully that answered your question about Title I data. Um, there's another question here about um, uh, the E-rate program and whether anyone can speak generally about charters experiences applying and receiving funds the, under the program. <clears throat> um, she has not heard schools talk about it, so she's not sure if this is something they've accessed in the past. So I think one question we're not sh it, the connectivity funds are not necessarily E-rate, but the reimbursement might look like E-rate. Are we, do we have any more info on that, Lindsay? So the 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 title of the program says like money through E-rate to support, but it's not going to be E-rate as we know it, to, to your point. I, I mentioned that within 60 days, the FCC is going to regulate what this program looks like. Um, the biggest thing is that it uses E-rate eligibility. So those entities that are eligible for E-rate right now will be eligible for this money. Um, but I think we need to wait and see the specifics of how it will go out, except we know it will be for reimbursements. Um, I don't have any specific knowledge of how charters have accessed it in the past, but I'm sure they have probably through an LEA. Um, but, and, but schools directly, I believe, are eligible to apply. I just don't have that particular knowledge. So that'd be something we could look into. Yeah, I certainly know of some charters and charter networks that have benefited from the program. Um, and if anyone on the webinar wants to throw their experience in the chat here and um, say yay or nay, um, feel free to do that. Um, all right, let's take on some more of these questions. Um, there is an earlier question about how um, this funding might impact Title I funding for this year, I guess, in discretionary appropriations, if we're likely to see an increase or not. Um, or um, let's see, in terms of Title I funding for FY22, will they be comparable to FY21 or larger? I guess that's a that's a big question. Vic, any thoughts on? Well, uh... We don't have a, a loss of the answer to that, but I, I think we're all assuming that the Biden administration is going to request an increase uh, in, in Title I funding uh, in their budget, which we're now hearing is likely to be out at, in May or June. Uh, and you know, most of the Democrats who now control Congress have talked about increases as well. So, I mean, I think we've got a pretty good shot at, at a decent sized increase. Um, it's, that's not going to mean Title I is going to be anywhere near comparable to these other amounts that we've been talking about. But I, I, I think we're looking at it. At a, we have a pretty positive outlook for Title I funding for the coming year. Thanks. Um, all right. So we have another question. Districts follow rules making charter purchase, charters purchase materials, supplies, and then show receipts for purchases before funds are given to the schools. Any chance this is being looked at to amend for this money? Charters may not have the money on hand to buy such items. So funds being allocated, not up front, but on a reimbursement basis. I have heard another anecdote like this. This is more traditionally how say CSP funds would be awarded, but um, 
Tom, Lindsay, any thoughts about the, um, the requirement that some states might be implementing to operate on a reimbursement basis? Certainly not a federal requirement. Yeah. So if it's going to be revisited, I think it has to be revisited at the state or the local level. Yeah, I mean the federal the federal requirements are it, it can be reimbursements or it can be like just funding it all together. Um, so I think that sounds more like a, a district issue. Um, hmm. The Fed the department normally will put a state under an extremely uh, unusually will put a state on reimbursement if it has a funds management issue, which we've had once in a, they've had once in a while. But that's not the, usually the, the money is obligated. The state or the local can begin drawing it down, does not have to submit receipts for reimbursement. Yeah, Eric Premack is saying reimbursement basis may stem from federal cash management mandates mm. and the st state's methods to implement them. Many states will not advance all the money up front and require documentation. Um, Rod's question makes it sound like it's pretty micro in terms of what they're requiring. Um, yeah, I think this is something that it would be helpful to get additional guidance potentially from the department on, on the extent to which this is required and to what extent these funds can just flow as they would under Title I, um, which I'm guessing is not on a reimbursement basis for charters in California, maybe. Um, all right, let's see if we can, we have seven minutes left. Um, uh, we have a question, um, will charter management organizations be able to access any of these funds on behalf of the schools and their network? Um, so CMOs are, um, unless they are designated the LEA for Title I purposes, which I think is actually the case in a, maybe one place, they are not going to be the direct recipients of the ESSER funds. As a nonprofit, they may be able to apply um, for some of the state reservation funds. So, um, and now there's these, the COVID testing money, <laughs> which could be interesting because there are some, I think, charter network based approaches to testing that are already going on. Um, but do we have any, is that gonna be formula? We don't probably know that that's gonna be, yeah. Um, and thank you for clarifying it was COVID testing because I saw the alert and I thought it was like the other kind of testing. <laughs> I was really confused, <laughs> just state assessments. What? Um, all right, I think we've answered these questions about timeframes um, that we do think that um, the funds will be disperse in time for um, summer. Um, we have a question about teacher retention and using funds for teacher retention. Do you have any thoughts about how these funds could be used to retain teachers? Well, it could, it probably could just support whatever a district currently does to address these. But I think I'm thinking, you know, a lot of teachers were nervous to come back to school because of COVID. Um, you know, and staff, staff, of course, need to be in school if kids are going to go back to school. So maybe it's providing like bonuses, like to get people to come back as part of a broader, like helping staff, like deal with recovery effort. Um, so that's one example. But I mean, it, you know, a lot of districts have their own retention plans for teachers, recruitment and retention. So it could supplement what's already underway. Um, and particularly if there's anything unique that you want to do in terms of COVID, that could also be supported. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, all right, we have a question here from Corey. If the money under ESSER 2, which still has not been allocated in New York and ARPA is still being allocated this year, will it be based on enrollment for 20 to 21 versus 21, 22, I guess? And how will this impact new charters opening next year? Um, that's actually, so that's, go ahead, Tom. Good question. Yeah. I think we don't know yet. Yeah. But the districts, the dis, the states won't know their title, their fiscal year 21 or their 
21-22 Title I allocations until June, or maybe even a little later. Um, I would have expected the districts to allocate this ESSER three money before then, but if they don't, then they will no longer be the most recent Title I shares. So it might actually flip to the next year. This is probably something that they'll have to issue guidance. I think they're gonna to have to issue the guidance, up, re-up the guidance they did for new and expanding charter schools that gets to those adjusted allocations too. Uh, but thanks for asking that, Corey. Um, all right, we are almost at time. Um, just real quick, um, one of the funds that disappeared in this tranche was gear. Do you guys know any intel on why we don't have any funds for the governors this time, given how much was in there? I do, because the governors are getting $340 billion. So the, the justification was that gear probably wasn't necessary. Additionally, there was, you know, given that this is a Democrat only bill, some states did opt to use gear for some school choice initiatives in the past. Um, and the Democrats, the Democrats uh, did not like that. So I think, you know, the politics around gear coupled with the 340 billion that governors are getting kind of left no support for the program from their, their thoughts. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, well, um, thank you for your questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us afterwards if we didn't answer your questions or raised more questions. If you have um, questions like that last one, Corey, that we should probably make sure is addressed in guidance. Um, thank you for everyone. Thanks to Lindsay, Tom, and Vic um, for presenting and give us, giving us your wisdom today. Um, and just as a reminder, there will be a recording sent out. If you are on this web webinar, you registered for it, it will be in your inbox. So thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon.